This is going to be an interview with uh, Roy Howard and Rainer Schulte from the Center for Translation Studies at the University of Texas at Dallas. The interview is supposed to be published thereafter in, the, in a future issue of Translation Review. My particular interest in the 19th century poetry that is the subject of your musical transformation and your musical performances is the drastic changes that occurred in the second part of the 19th century in France with Charles Baudelaire, Mallarmé and Rimbaud particularly. What I would like for you to do first before we go into some of the details, whether you from your point of view could give us a kind of background, conceptual background overview of how you see the energy and the creativity and the importance of the French development of poetry in the second part of the 19th century especially since the emphasis before was really more directed toward the Germanic languages. So please let me hear or let us hear of how you put this all together. All right. It's quite hard in a way to separate the languages and the cultures. One of the, the differences is that the French language does not have tonic accents like mm. English or German. So poetry and poetic meter oper operate in a different way. You'll, French lines will have a fixed number of feet, but won't have regular accents within, within these lines. Um, that's one of the reasons for the way the French, the way French poetry went off on its own. But rather ironically, um, one of the other reasons <coughs> it went off in the direction it did was Richard Wagner. <coughs> and th this is where Baudelaire comes in. He took his poetry there, but Baudelaire, of course, was the, the greatest of the French champions of Wagner from the 18, uh, 1850s, 40s, was it? Mm -hmm. Yes, 18, of course, mm -hmm. the 1840s, from the 1840s onwards, in the last few years of his life, he championed him. And I think what interested him, apart from the emotional power and imagery, was the plasticity of that music, how flexible and supple it was. I think he saw there uh, an analogy to what the French language could do and what he was attempting to do in his poetry. In a way, I suspect he was already thinking of Gesamtkunstwerk equivalent mm -hmm. in his poetry. Now, Baudelaire died in 1867. Mm -hmm. His poetry had been set to music by some of his friends who went to bars with him, but not by what we would call serious composers. So there were sort of light waltzes to L'Invitation au Voyage, for example. He left uh, a sort of challenge in his prose version of L'Invitation au Voyage, saying, when are composers going to try and set my other version, the poetic version, to music? Suddenly, three years after he had died, three composers, all at once, three composers, major ones, whom, who are very well remembered now, all set him at once. They were all friends, and I can't help suspecting that there was some degree of collusion there. It was Duparc, Chaprier, and Gabriel Fauré mm. in 1870. And it was, again, it was a crucial year of interaction because it was the year of, the, of Napoleon III's ill fated attempt at um, taking on um, Prussian, Prussia. The France lost and was occupied by the Prussian armies. Um, they lost, a, of course, France lost a lot of face. But as often in these circumstances, it was the time when it had to look at itself and reinvent itself artistically. So the Société Nationale uh, de Musique was started up in the wake of that. But it was during the Siege of Paris, in fact, that certainly that Duparc wrote the L'Invitation au Voyage, a song that we now know. Apparently he made several attempts at it before he he completed the one that has survived. Round about the same time, Emmanuel Chabri did one of the same song, which is quite different from Duparc's, very beautiful. Um, and this tended to be overlooked. Gabriel Fauré took uh, one of the poems that was not from the Fleur du Mal, Im, Im, Im yeah. and set it 
he subsequently sent two more, and by doing so, he did something rather special because he was the first composer uh, to set a group of, my, of Baudelaire poems. And although the, the other two aren't dated, we suspect they date from much about the same time. I'll be talking about it. This is the lecture tomorrow because they belong stylistically. They belong very much together and form a very coherent group. Now, I think the other thing about this turning point here was when these musicians took on Baudelaire, it was the catalyst that turned the, what was known as the French romance, the equivalent of the simpler lead, into the melody, and took what Baudelaire and other poets had already done with French poetry, turned it into a, a particular kind of artwork of its own. They translated this into musical form and invented the song as something that would, could follow the contours or could recreate the forms and structures of a poem or translate them in other ways, rather than just being strophic and singing a simple song to the verses of a poem. In their approaches, each one of them differently, uh, whether it was Foray or someone else, did they have particularly different approaches to this? Did they have uh, interpretive approaches that were different? Uh, did they think that the original uh, written poem and the form uh, should be maintained? Or did they think that they could do whatever they wanted to? That's a, a really interesting one. I think it's somewhere in between the two. Um, <clears throat> I don't think that, that technically, they could do whatever they wanted to, provided, of course, good taste was maintained and provided there was some artistic integrity. That immediately would limit it. So they couldn't do just anything. They had to follow what their conscious consciences told them was good art. And, but the big departure, I think, was seeing that the, the old form of the romance, the strophic form, which did pretty well follow the contours of a poem, would no longer serve for the sort of poetry they were looking at. And that there were depths, there were layers and depths in that poetry that they had to translate into music. Mm -hmm. And ways in which the words could be set, and this, the unusual accentuation of the, of the French language, one thinks of Duparc's and Chabré's simultaneous setting of L'Invitation au Voyage, where Duparc sets it to the rhythm Mon enfant, ma soeur, songe à la douceur. Chapre sets it on the beat, Mon enfant, ma soeur, songe à la douceur. Both of them are perfectly valid. There's no wrong, there's no right way about it. So there would be multiple interpretations of the same text, and from your point of view, from a musical training, is it immediately visible or decipherable what the differences are? You have to look quite closely. Mm -hmm. I should invoke my editorial partner um, in this editing enterprise for Foray's Complete Songs, Emily Kilpatrick, who has become very interested in this now and is working on Foray's Verlaine settings, the, the five Venetian songs and La Bonne Chanson. She's looking at the structure of these songs, which is quite hard to decipher. They've really, they've they have never been analysed in any systematic way because they don't fall into easily, um, they don't fall into obvious um, formal stereotypes or even archetypes. But she's beginning to look at what structures the, po the various poems follow and how she can see this reflected or translated in music. And I use the word translated because the composer is not doing literally the same thing, but is finding metaphors for these structures mm. to, to match and highlight what's in the poems. And in Verlaine's case, it's particularly the music part that needs to be transferred, yes. because yes. some of the poems by Verlaine can actually not be translated. Yes. Uh, as he says, de la musique avant toute chose. And I'm, con I'm continuously amazed that, especially translating them into English, that that music can hardly be represented. I think it's probably a little easier in German that it could that that part of of his poetry could be translated into this. Um, 
when you look, or the composer actually, when the composer looks at a stanza or looks at the poem, whether if it's a Baudelaire poem, uh, chanson de ton, or whatever it is, uh, where do you think they they find their initi initi uh, the, the beginning beginning focal point? Um, I looked at some of these poems again and realized that in some cases the stanza is left out. Yeah. And then I'm wondering what that does to the poem. Is that ultimately, is the transferal, is it content, is it sense, or is it something else? It's sometimes sound and I think it's music. I've imagined, for example, in some, uh, some of the songs in that repertoire, Debussy or Fauré, when a stanza is left out of the song, if there's any kind of um, uh, strophic structure to the song that would allow it to be put back, for example, at Levo's Dispel of, of Fauré, there is one stanza that's taken out. It is a strophic enough song that one could go around the loop once more and put that stanza back in. I've tried doing it to see what would happen. It just sounds wrong. It mm -hmm. won't fit the music. So mm -hmm. the compo certainly in that case, Fauré was soaking in the sounds of the vowels. He was taking in the rhyme schemes, strong or weak rhyme schemes, um, line endings, working out the music that would suit them. And if he found that there was one stanza where it was not going, he would rather miss it out. But of course, he would look very carefully to see whether the whether the pot, the the integrity of the poem sense could be maintained without that stanza. But in all cases, we have to assume that the composer brings his specific interpretive perspective to the poem. So you talked extensively also about the differences or the yeah the differences that occur. In the punctuation. So if you have a semicolon in one, all of a sudden it becomes something else. And how, how does that affect the composition then, number one? And you also talk extensively about the power of the exclamation mark. How, how does that influence the, the translation of the poem into music? I have to speak here for Emily Kilpatrick, who did that particular article, and she became very interested in this as we were editing the songs together. We were aware that not only does, does the composer sometimes miss out strophes, but occasionally will change a word or two in the middle of a stanza of the composers, of the poets rather, um, usually in order to make the rhythm work better or just to find better, as, um, better more assonant vowels, um, normally sometimes consonants, for the music that they're conceiving. And we noticed often that in a song manuscript uh, punctuation was missing or seemed to be corrupted. It, there has been a practice generally in musical editions to restore the punctuation to what the poet wrote. Sometimes that is correct when it's just been copied out carefully. But Fauré in particular um, sometimes changes it. And when he changes, a, say, a semicolon or, or a comma to an exclamation mark, we suspect that he's telling the singer something there along the lines of when you read the poem, you can see where these lines are leading, you can see where the line breaks are, how the lines are grouped. When, as soon as the poem goes into a song, that structure is broken, it's dissolved. One line's leading into another, and only the music decides how much they are separated. In order to put an emphasis that's vis visually obvious when you read the poem, in order to convey that in the song, one has to change the punctuation, put an exclamation mark, or sometimes turn a comma into a semicolon. Sometimes you use commas to say the singer will have to breathe here. There's such a multiplicity of, of meanings for these things. So from that point of view, does the punctuation that is being changed by the composer, does that change the dynamics of the poem? Or does that begin to emphasize a particular moment or word in the poem? Or does it go that you could develop a particular crescendo or decrescendo? Is that also part? 
it can do all these things. Uh -huh. And it shows that, of course, a song setting of a poem is a very distinct interpretation of the poem. If we compare, for example, Fauré's and Debussy's settings of the same Verlaine poems, they go in completely different directions. Mm -hmm. They're incredibly beautiful, each one. Um, en Sourdine, uh, Debussy set that twice, or um, Selig does Long um, <coughs> uh, Fauré makes it the last song of a cycle, Debussy makes it the opening <coughs> song of a set. They treat it quite differently, and yet each one of them <coughs> has treated it, I couldn't say they've treated it with freedom, they, of course, they have to interpret it, but they've gone into the poetry, they've found a line inside the poem which they have followed absolutely relentlessly mm -hmm. in, in terms of their own logic. But like two different performances of the same concert piece by somebody paying close attention to it, it's taken them in different directions. And you have two very different songs which emphasise different words, different sounds in the poems as well. In general, when the composer gets to the poem, does he have a, a female or a male voice in mind? It's, this is really interesting. Um, <clears throat> because I could see some of the poems, like uh, if it were, was Correspondence ever set to music by Baudelaire? Well, wh whatever, but I, I could yeah. see that some of these poems fall more into a, let's say, soprano voice than into either alto or basso. And I have always wondered uh, what would happen if you change. I mean, the poet did not write the poem for a particular female or male uh, person, but some or other it does, it does have its influence on this. There are some signs, there are also signs that the composers tend not to be strict. It's surprising how much the traditional trouser role comes into that. So you can have a poem that's very much a man's poem, sung by, by a woman, La Bonne Chanson, mm -hmm. is, the, is the clear example of that. Now, Fauré wrote that very deliberately for the singer Emma Bardak, and he maintained right to the end of his life that she had been the finest interpreter he had ever experienced mm -hmm. of that cycle. She was not a professional singer because of her of, of her of social assumptions at the time. She wouldn't go onto a concert platform. She would only sing at private gatherings. He said she had never been bettered. But the concert performances of it were done by another aristocratic singer, a very distinguished tenor, Maurice Bages, mm -hmm. a good friend of Fauré's, who also was too aristocratic to have a fully professional career. So he didn't go into the opera houses, but he sang he did sing at public concerts, and he he drew the line there. And in a way, it, one would think this is, you could call it much more authentic to the spirit of the poems, to hear them sung by, by male voice. On the other hand, Fauré had no concerns about that. He, as far as he was concerned, it made little difference. There's another case that <coughs> Marion and I were looking at recently, Fauré's poem, Isi Ba, which Seem it's a it's a Sully Goudon poem, and it would appear to be first it's first person, and you assume it's a man, but of course he could be speaking for a woman. It could be either a woman or a man uttering the sentiments of that poem. However, looking at the last page of Fauré's song, there are certain interactions of the voice and the piano. There are appoggiaturas and um, dissonant notes that have to resolve in a certain way where if you take it literally with the female voice and the piano, they clash in what would s seem to be an incorrect way. In fact, because the, tem the timbre of the voice is different, it doesn't matter too much. But when I look it on, on the page, I immediately think he must have conceived this song for male voice, because one octave down, these clashes become technically mm -hmm. correct. You have, the, you have the appoggiatura at the octave, of the of the resolution and that's that's correct. However, Fauré had that song premiered by a soprano, so mm -hmm. in the end he wasn't too worried by it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes circumstances played its part. He had the chance of a performance and there was a good singer. He wasn't too worried whether it was in the original key or not, or whether it was a, a man or a woman singing it. From a 
musical point of view, or first of all from the poetry point of view, it is Baudelaire who introduced some major innovative uh, poetic devices, if I want to call it, and they are quite dissonant in comparison to what there was before, and also the combination of the verbal and the visual and the musical from Baudelaire's point of view. In any way, did that particular characteristic of the poetry, which I frequently refer to as a kind of dissonant sound, could one also say that that had an impact on the changes of the music in the second part, let's say, of the 19th century? I think you, you heard that's an absolute bullseye. For I hear this, Chambray's music is, one can see it focusing, focusing on the dissonance and rubbing voices and different sounds together in quite an abrasive way. Chambray, it's obvious. I find this in Gabriel Fauré, who does not have the reputation for this, but in performing him, his music comes to life. If you push one voice against the other, you can, uh -huh. you can feel mm -hmm. this friction. There's, a, there's quite an abrasive surface to Fauré's music. It has to be driven along quite relentlessly, and he is known for doing this himself. He never liked rhythms to get flaccid or tempi mm -hmm. to get too slow. There's, there's, a, there's a sort of slightly rough tensile energy in this music. And do you see it's absolutely obvious. Mm. It's right on the surface. If one extends this a little further, uh, how would you say that the moments that we have in the poetry that could be referred to what I would call the silences, you know, when you have Musicien du Silence, is there something comparable in the musical part that I could go into some of the musical structure and say here is a moment of silence that would correspond maybe to a moment in the poem? Yes, the, all of these. All of these. Uh -huh. Leon Siles, Debussy talked about it more than any of the others did and he talked about it when he was composing his opera Pelias et Milisande. Mm -hmm. He wrote to Chausson, another of the great songwriters, um, who, who was his friend. He said, I'm ex in this I'm trying to explore the role of silence, which sometimes can be more expressive than sound can be if it's in the right place. Mm. Who are the composers who actually, at that time, not the very modern one, but who at the time are the composers who set the music to Mallarmé? Um, Debussy, when he was very young, in 1882, set Mallarmé's Apparition. That must have been one of the earliest ones. The earliest, okay. And then later on, obviously, the... Then he came back and did three more, at the same time as Ravel did three more. But Ravel, in 1902, set Mallarmé's Saint in a very daily way. Oh, that was... Uh, that's, that's, an, that's, that's, er, that's quite early. And you said Ravel did that? Pardon? Who, who did uh, that? Ravel. Well, well, okay. Uh -huh. Foring never set any. Um, uh, Duparc, no, I don't think Chausson, no, Chausson didn't set mm -hmm. him. They were still, he was, he was still regarded as almost defying musical setting. Although I, I, a less known uh, contemporary of Debussy's, um, the uh, his name will just come back to me. He's the man who ran the L'Art Indépendant Ed, uh, bookshop, Edmond Bailly, mm -hmm. who was essentially an amateur musician who had studied Indian music. He taught Debussy about that. He was very interested in music from all around the world. He was setting Malarmé um, around about the turn of the century. These, you can find these in the Bibliothèque Nationale. They're very little known. And I think he was... Some of these minor musicians who would do daring things, we don't hear about it now, but they give, mm -hmm. they give the better known composers ideas. I think they saw them and thought, hmm, how have I got that? Mallarmé was quite pleased with uh, Debussy's uh, composition of the... La Premidida. La Premidida. Which is really yeah. very much a translation of the poem right into mm -hmm. music. Okay. And it transfers meant, there, of course the words are not there, it, um, it makes a metaphor of the poem in many ways. Mm -hmm. He takes motives from it and turns them into orchestral terms.
what to me was interesting that Malarmé was obviously quite suspicious of what Debussy could do with the afternoon of a fawn. And then when it actually was done, he was absolutely amazed and said, you have expanded my view or my vision of the poem beyond the, uh, the verbal. Like yeah. From your point of view, first of all, I'm intrigued that all of a sudden, especially in the 19th century, we have the interest of translating verbal texts into music or even verbal texts into images, into paintings and so on. Uh, before I go any further there, why do you think that somebody, that most of the composers were not particularly interested in writing compositions for the general, let's say, French Romantic, Lamartine, for example? Uh, maybe there are some poems that have been. But what I find intriguing is what attracted these composers to the particular sensibility of, let's say, De, uh, uh, Malarmé or even Rimbaud or whatever, whoever the names are. And why do we all of a sudden in the 19th century have that kind of interest in transforming verbal things into music or paintings into music and then naturally in the 20th century it's being enlarged into the multimedia. Mm. I'm, I'm sure that Baudelaire's synesthesia mm -hmm. uh, as a sort of counterpart to Wagner's Gesamtkunstwerk, a thing playing their part there is a movement. It's something of the times that musicians were wanting to reciprocate, I think, the way in which literature was trying to... Li literature which, again, can never be read just on the surface, particularly that poetry. You read the surface and it seems to be telling you a sort of story, but anybody who knows that literature well is watching for the line patterns, the, the metric patterns, the rhyme schemes, the way lines repeat. There are dances and games going on within these poems, and there's a virtuosity of structure that Baudelaire took up, developed like, like really nobody had for several hundreds of years, because that had been going on in much older French poetry. He picked this up, plays plays it to a virtuoso degree, at the same time as uh, making poems of complete onomatopoeia, at the same time as, as he tells the, surf, the surface story of his poem. It's, it's incredibly virtuoso. That's making music of the poem, and musicians, I think, are thinking, can we suggest and evoke in our music without being too literal? Debussy, particularly, he was on record as being very suspicious of trying to make music express other things or shadow the other arts. He said you can translate it, but you can't. His, his criticism of Wagner was that Wagner's formula meant that the music had to keep pace with the words in the libretto the whole time. And he said it's impossible. They breathe at different rates. And so you find that the one is out of breath, panting to keep up with the other, or else it's sitting there um, getting tired, waiting for the other one to catch up with it. He said you can't. You can't do this, you have to, you can't be so literal. Mm. I see one of the major changes that all of a sudden with the new musical concepts that we have and the new musical structures that come into being uh, at that particular time, that it was to recreate the atmosphere of the text more so than the specific semantic associations of a word. And that's why we also have in Baudelaire and thereafter the creation of sound patterns that then can be attractive to a composer. Because today I don't think we really like too much to read Lamartine from one end to the next, or even some of the German Romantic uh, poets. So I see this as a, as a major change that all of a sudden it is the flexibility and the inherent associative power that the music has that is being generated by the different kind of poetry that we find with Baudelaire thereafter. Yeah. In an odd way, they would never have used the word, but it's a kind of neoclassicism perhaps, hmm. in that the Romantics had, and this, any textbook will tell us this, that the Romantics go for immediate expression of feeling um, rather than making structure control everything. 
Um, and I see here from Baudelaire onwards, although we think of him as an utter romantic, in a way his discipline, his technical discipline, is saying that te whatever, the, whatever the intensity of emotion that is being conveyed, that his poetic discipline is taking command here, not only controlling it but funneling it and making the, ex making the, the expression all the more intense. So there's a strange sort of neoclassicism, but not a, not in any colder expression this mm -hmm. way. It's making the structure become an integral part of the expression and expressive in itself. And one also has to take into consideration that with the music, we're singing the word. And we are no longer just pronouncing it or reading it. And for me, this is in, uh, very interesting because when I have poetry workshops, uh, students always want to read, but not to reenact in their reading the sound possibilities, not only of a word, but of the combination of words. And uh, that seems to me is being liberated with the poetry of the second part of the 19th century, that all of a sudden associations in the mind of the poet can come to live, which are no longer restricted to a one, restricted to one particular meaning. Yes. And that's why we had, had all the difficulties with the poetry. And that's symbolism. Uh, well, yeah, that is part of um, the symbolism. There's something that struck me there, and that's the relationship between the speaking and singing, and how close it is or isn't. And at the time, in the late 19th century, when the melody had become the melody, the standard expression among French musicians, although it was uh, can see people playing on this, the verb that was used to perform was dire, not chanter. You will mm -hmm. very rarely find uh, a reference to somebody chanter des mélodies. That you will find. So it says dire la mélodie. Il a dit mes mélodies. Ah, mm -hmm. Et quelqu'un a prononcé les mélodies de, de, du, du parc. They'll pronounce them, they'll say them. They very rarely say sing them. Now, Fauré and Debussy are both on record as telling singers. Well, Debussy was more extreme as usual. He said, forget you're a singer, I want you to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and Fauré... That was Debussy. That was Debussy. Mm -hmm. Fauré is quoted by Claire Croiset, who worked very closely with him, as saying, the best advice I can give to musicians is to learn to, to speak the poem, learn to read, read the poem out, um, to declaim the poem before they learn the music and le then learn the music and speak the, mu speak the poem through the music. But the, the, the song has been, the melody, has been des designed to let you speak the poem through it. And of course, you have to have a nice voice, a beautiful voice, and sing it beautifully. It's very, it's very important. But he doesn't want bel canto, he doesn't want the poetry, the words to be forgotten in an attempt to make beautiful sounds and beautiful melodies. And with all of them, particularly as later in their lives, you'll find in their early songs, the song, the singer will have beautiful melodies to sing at the same time, although they will match the words very nicely. More and more it will become like a parlando, and the piano or the orchestra will be tracing the slower melodies, and the, the singers will be speaking the words, pitch speaking them mm -hmm. through that, in ways that themselves are not particularly beautiful melodies. So many of these later songs you couldn't, for example, transcribe for violin and piano because the violin would just seem to be chattering aimlessly. Mm -hmm. You need the words for these lines to make sense. Well, eventually, uh, I don't see that much in the 19th century composition, but when we go to Schoenberg, then all of a sudden, even, yeah, even, even the word becomes a word of letters rather than a word which is indicative again that we're so much interested in what kind of effect can be produced by the sound and the silences in this case than rather the pure semantic part. I think that's for me the major change that we are overcoming the restriction of semantics because once you say this is what it means then there is no more discussion. Uh, and I think that's what the music has added to the poetry and that's why it has been so successful in, in being received. That brings me to one other thing. Do we have any record of how this kind of change or how these compositions were received by the audience? Oh yes, there's, 
and <clears throat> there are, these concerts were reviewed at the time and we have a range of criticisms. There's a whole website now devoted to uh, francophone um, musical criticism. Mm -hmm. One can find it online. It's a group of scholars, French, <clears throat> international group of scholars, French, German, American, British and others, have been transcribing <clears throat> the reviews from the time and putting them <clears throat> into this initiative. So one can read them. And as usual with criticisms, you'll see the less uh, <clears throat> the less perceptive critics usually react against what's new and not like it because mm. it's not as nice as what they're used to. But there are perceptive ones too who are noticing and telling the readers of the of the mm -hmm. of the journals what has been going on and where this music is aiming. Mm -hmm. I always thought if we go to the moment when a new work appeared and we then look at how it was received and generally the strongest negative reactions to what was performed and what was perceived turns out to be the innovation. Very often, yes, because yeah. it's, the, it's, it's, the, the, it's the one that, that confounds everybody's expectations mm. that will turn, mm. turn them I always thought that would make an extremely interesting book. Yes. Well, there, in a way there is one, if I, you must know Nicholas Slonimsky's yes. kind of musical inventive, right. mm. in which he has quoted all the incre extremely good things that critics have said about what have turned out to be mm. the most epoch-making mm. works. Am I correct in saying that Proust actually was also negative about Fauré? Not about Fauré as far as I know. No? He, in fact, he was he was almost obsessively in love with the music. Okay. He 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 used he on more than one occasion asked hired musicians to come to his house. And oh, that I know. Yes, concerts. yes. Mm -hmm. I wonder. I thought he first was hmm. that that the audience didn't like the or the younger generation didn't long, liked Foray's music, but then changed his mind later on. Though he reported secondhand. And, and this is very apt to what you are just saying, that when Fauré wrote La Bonne Chanson, mm -hmm. it took his musical language to such an extreme, he, he just flew, I think, without any sort of safety harness, <clears throat> high in the air with Verlaine's poetry there. Of course, Verlaine wrote these poems on an extraordinary sort of high, mm -hmm. it was as high psychologically as high as a kite when he wrote them. And Fauré managed to go there with him, and the music is for teaching this, it's whizzing around corners on two wheels. You can almost, compositionally, you can almost smell the burning rubber mm -hmm. at times. You, he does such unexpected things, then always lands somewhere that's correct. But it's Im almost impossible to follow. Now, Saint-Saëns and many other composers just couldn't follow him at the time. He quoted in a letter to Maurice Bages that Camille Benoit had troubled him recently by saying, oh, Fauré, what are you doing setting all this Berlin? You're becoming all incoherent and jumbled. You know, we hope you'll come come back out of there and start writing sensible music again. For he knew what he was doing, but it was coming from professionals. Sensos, when he saw red proofs of La Bonne Chanson, exclaimed, Fauré has gone completely mad. And he was very fond of Fauré, who had been his student. They were lifelong mm -hmm, friends. Mm -hmm. um, Proust quotes this and said, it is said that La Bonne Chanson, Fauré has lost has lost his touch and has gone off the rails. <clears throat> even, um, <clears throat> they're saying that even that that his talent is, is is withering and he's inferior to Debussy. And he quotes it as Debussy not liking La Bonne Chanson. Mm -hmm. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. But we know that in later life, Debussy thought extremely highly of La Bonne Chanson and studied it very closely. So the the, the first reactions. They had to consider it. it. Took them quite a while to catch up with it. From my point of view, how can one? And I come from the instructional point of view right now. How far can one introduce an audience that is not musical trained to understanding some of the musical structures and maybe even musical innovations that these composers brought to the transformation. Is that possible or does somebody have to have? It helps. I think one can explain things. There are visual ways and 
verbal ways of showing some of what's going on. One of my colleagues, for example, Heath Lees, who has written, a, I think, a very instructive book about Mallarmé and Wagner. Who is this? Heath Lees, his name is. He's, Don't know him. He's a Scotsman based in, in New Zealand, musical professor, very, very, very much a literature person too. I've heard him in lectures able to explain what is going on in Mallarmé in ways that surprise me by their simplicity. In Mallarmé, the poem? In the poem, yes. Oh, yeah. That I understand. I, I, can, I can talk through Malarmé the Saint. I have no major problems and I can reconstruct this. But then if I have the musical piece, how do you bring this to, to the audience? We had this, uh, I think his name is Greenberg or so. He gives these lectures on music. And he gave one here in Dallas about how to listen to Stravinsky. And what amazed me is the audience was probably 80% had no musical training. And when he was finished, you could see that the light went on in most of them. Mm -hmm. And there was an excitement about, I have learned something of how to listen to Stravinsky and not be either embarrassed or be frustrated or don't know what's going on. So yes. my question is to you and myself as an instructor, how far can we convey that kind of musical thinking without musical training to another person who is not? That's, that's, to me, that's an intriguing question. Well, I think we can. Um, in a way that I mentioned Heath, the example of Heath Lees because I felt that there are musical equivalents of that. Mm -hmm. that in a way, what your, your colleague, I think, was doing is showing the audience where the doors and windows are in that music, where you can get mm -hmm. in and out of it. I like the doors and windows. Mm -hmm. I like that image. And if they, know where, if they know where to be looking for these, one can do this with music. You know, uh -huh. It's not that difficult. I think of, for example, the way Debussy does that in his own music. There's, there are sophisticated relationships which only the musically trained will pick up. But he's also aiming, for example, in something like La Mer, he is constructing the music in very elemental ways. So that there are areas where the music is very tonally stable. There are areas where the music is tumbling over itself, is it unstable. And you have contrasts between these. Anybody, anybody listening, whether musically trained or not, can perceive these differences. Mm -hmm. There are such elemental ones. If one can point out this is what's going on, and just say to the audience, be alert for these, <clears throat> they, are they are part of the story, you you're already winning them. And the other thing I think is clarity in the performance, which all the composers oh, yes. insisted on. So if one plays that music in a fuzzy way, tries to make it beautiful and over-refined, we're obfuscating it. Mm. Well, part of what we have right now in the musical performance, especially in piano, that if I wanted to exaggerate, the faster you play the piece, the better. And that obviously is backfiring more than ever. I've been to concerts when the, the technique was so outrageously fast and no problem, but it had lost all of its musical thinking and the reconstruction, internal reconstruction of the musical piece. And I think that is, that is the negative side right now of performances as we experience it f here in the United States. Anywhere. Anywhere, okay. And it works, I think, both ways. That there is, as with speaking, there is a natural pacing that will allow something to conve convey itself. If we rush it, it will be garbled. Mm -hmm. And it will be like talking too fast, to explaining something to somebody who doesn't know so quickly that they can't follow us. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if and I find this particularly with Vore, if it is done too slowly, it will lose its thread. Mm -hmm. And it will be, you will start seeing the tiny little, the, the, the constituent. But don't you think that that depends specifically how far the performer for a moment right now, how far the performer has really internally reconstructed the structure of the piece. Yeah, that it is not just a reading of the score, but it is, it is a reassembling, first to take it apart and then reassembling according to your or my interpretive perspective. It's how we read it. Mm. If a performer is reading the notes on the page of the score and playing them, saying, well, I'm playing the piece, 
they may not be playing the piece, they may be playing the notes, mm -hmm. but in Fauré in particular and in Debussy, there are, there are very strong musical gestures that have to be conveyed, they're expressive, they're almost architectonic gestures, almost visual ones, and we have to find the pacing for these too slow and the gestures will collapse, we'll mm -hmm. hear the constituent bits of them without the gestures, too fast and they'll, they'll be garbled. Um, this strikes me in a, in a particular way with Fauré, that, that the tempo sometimes has to come back and forward to match that. And there's something else that strikes me, as you may know, a little book, A Guide to French Poetry for Singers by David Hunter. I know of him, I've not, no. I find it a very useful little book, partly it's so clear and concise, but he makes the point early on in the book that this structure of the poems conveys its own expression very often, mm. and that any sort of educated French readers would have been expected to recognise these structures and what they were conveying. So the reader is not the, the perceptive reader, and the, particularly the person who is reading these poems publicly, for example, or who is conveying them, has to understand the, the verbal gestures and plays that are going on in it, not just read the word and say, I have now read that poem. They would be expected to understand and somehow be able to convey. He makes the point then that Debussy and Fauré and Duparc all, uh, all of these composers, and Poulain particularly, <coughs> who are very close friends of, of poets, understood this so, so intricately that when they were looking at a poem, they would be watching not just for the sound of the words, but for all the patterns and gestures, and thinking how music could accompany this without destroying it. And it also depends on the rhythm of the performer. Yes, and the performer then has to get to that place too. Uh, so yes. if we're playing notes off the page, we've hardly started. Mm -hmm. We have to get get that far and find what these gestures are. Well, that's what we have frequently also in the reading of poems. It's being read but not reenacted. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in some cases that the music was able to give another level to the atmosphere of the poem that could also then increase the intensity of the reading of the poem. And um, I think a, a really good Clear, clearly enunciated musical performance, one in which the phrase, the, the phrase structure is well articulated, can open the doors and the windows for the listener. They will show you where these doors are. Yes. And, and I'm are. convinced that in moments, if it is internalized and reconstructed, that the audience automatically, whether they are musically trained or not, will react to it. Yes, and in a way this is why in the middle of the 20th century, public audiences could flock to Toscanini's concerts whether they had heard one before, they knew that they would get something out of it because he presented the music so mm. clearly that they could hear what was going on and get into mm. it. A little unrelated, and then we go to something else. What do you think about uh, Pierre Boulez's transformations? I'm not an expert in that, I have to say. Uh -huh. Although I work with him on editorial matters, <clears throat> my my special musical specializations have not actually caught up with that sort mm -hmm. of school. I've never felt I'm well qualified. The only reason this is apart. The only reason I'm asking is when I was in music school, I had to turn pages for him. Right. Yeah. So like that, and and he was somebody when he wanted a three fortissimo, he would use his hand like this, and once in a while even break the. Yes. Break the one. I was just he knows, curious. He knows exactly what he wants, and mm. he has got an extraordinary intellect. It's mm. very obvious. So he knows exactly what he's doing. Yeah. I but, find it hard yeah. to follow because it's another musical world. And, I yeah. and also, the reading of his essays, or whatever you want to call it, it's not easy reading. Yes. I mean, sometimes I look at this and I'm not quite sure. Anyway, that uh, one thing we need to add to the interview, would you tell a little about your own background? Uh, that I think at least has to be incorporated somewhere. From a small Scottish village, um, <clears throat> but a, a quietly international one. My, both my parents were very keen amateur musicians. My mother came from Czechoslovakia hmm. um, and had found herself living in a small Scottish village, but there were, there were musical people around and I showed huge musical interest by the age I was, by the age of three. 
you know, my parents who were very alert uh, picked up on this and started me on piano lessons without forcing it. I'm eternally grateful to them that they never forced me one way or the other. Um, and I have to say that for most of my life, my concentration has been on instrumental music. Um, of course, uh, my mother was also a great Francophile, um, and she had lived in France, partly, and she was teaching me elementary French when I was, when I was a very small child. I know that rubbed off. I was always interested in, in French art of every kind. And when I was a student, French music, I found, was taking me more and more by stealth, if not by storm. And as I noticed, I noticed fascinating things about the structure of the structuring of music that I felt that had not been critically dealt with in the literature. There was a perception that French music was all beautiful colours, but and one can see why, because there are beautiful colours, but those who don't watch carefully can be seduced by the colours into not noticing there's anything mm. else. So I made that a specialisation. I, of course, I had the interest in the literature, but I played mostly the instrumental music, uh, accompanying singers quite very frequently. But in more recent years, when I was asked to take on the editing of Foray's complete songs, and, and also when I was, I, I'm involved uh, peripherally, well, I'm involved very closely in the new complete Debussy edition, but some of my colleagues... Say that again, please. There's a complete new Debussy edition oh, of okay. all his, a critical edition of all his mm -hmm. works. I've edited much of the piano output for that. It's, some of my colleagues are doing the songs, but I've been peripherally involved in checking what they're doing. We, we run ideas back and forward past one another. And I found myself being drawn more and more now into the relationship between poetry and music over the last decade mm. or more, and it's be now become a very strong interest, particularly shared with Emily Kilpatrick, who's also mm. my wife. Yeah, I did so read. I did read her essays. We're, we're sharing this, this right. all the time as we mm. work. So, where do you see your immediate future, if one may ask? Musicians never know where the immediate future <laughs> is. It always takes you. By surprise, it, when Peter's edition said we would like to publish for his complete songs, would you be interested in editing them? That was a surprise for me. Had that not happened, my life would have gone a different, a different mm -hmm. way. It was a major project. It has reflected itself in my concert programming since, <clears throat> and in in all my work. Mm -hmm. We organised. So. That. In your, uh, in your daily, or I should say yearly life, you perform all over the world, right? I perform solo, um, chamber music, songs, sometimes with orchestra too. So uh -huh. What kind of chamber music have you performed? Um, piano, um, piano in one instrument, or piano in song, of course, mm -hmm. or piano trios, quartets, quintets, okay. um, sextets. And in and which, which composers would, would come to mind immediately? Anybody. Anybody, I've, okay. I've been, had a great pleasure in playing with the Panoka Quartet from Prague. Mm -hmm. We've performed Fauré and Dvorak Quintets. I adore okay. Dvorak's music. Okay. I and I can see, if, I, I know where that comes from. Um, <clears throat> but I'll play anything from Bach to, um, Bach to music written last mm -hmm. month. Okay. And that's in my, my general concert repertoire is is a wide one, although of course I have my favorites, and they're not all French. Mm. Well, I didn't think they would be, <laughs> but so. Is there anything else you would like to add? The only other name that's been lurking in the back of my mind during our conversation, particularly in connection with Baudelaire, is that of Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, okay. Who, mm. of course, was um, one of Baudelaire's absolute heroes, mm. and one of Ravel's, and one of Debussy's. And, I think Ravel and even Malarmé. And Malarmé, mm. yes, absolutely. Mm. And Ravel, as usual, who, who had, uh, wore his intellect lightly, but it was a very keen one, he drew several threads together when he, point, when he stated repeatedly that one of his compositional teachers had been Edgar Allan Poe. And he said, you, if you must read his philosophy of composition mm. in order to see how this operates and see how that relates to his... Mm. To the poem, The Raven, which he deconstructs in that essay. Now, <clears throat> Ravel said, personally, I take that essay at its word. I can believe that that's how it was. The Raven was 
was con conceived and, and brought to completion. I do that myself in my music, and I learnt a lot of this from Poe, from mm -hmm. the skill in Poe's, Edgar Allan Poe's writing. Mallarmé did not believe that that essay was to be taken literally. He felt that it was a, that it was analysis put onto the poem afterwards. But the beauty of Poe's position is that if that isn't how he wrote, if what he says he is doing is not really the way he wrote the Raven, it is certainly what he is doing in that essay. Mm -hmm. So he can't lose. It's a beautiful position to be mm -hmm. in. It makes the point that that sort of operation and that sort of structural planning mm -hmm. has to go on in good artistic. Well, practice. those translations have had a tremendous influence. Yes, uh, and uh, and one can see one can see how this echoed in Baudelaire and came right mm -hmm. through. So there was Ravel finding it in Poe, but knowing he had already finding what did you say? Find, finding this whole philosophy of composition oh, okay. in Edgar Allan Poe, mm -hmm. but realizing that he had been breakfasting, lunching, and dining on it through Baudelaire since he was a, mm -hmm. since he was a child, really. So he recognized something mm -hmm. already. From yes, I think that is a very important aspect of the transformations that took place in the second part of the 19th century, and Edgar yeah. Allan Poe certainly at the forefront. He was huge in France. He was more mm -hmm. recognized there than he was in the English-speaking yeah. countries. The other thing this has not immediately to do is I was always amazed uh, Longfellow wrote one of the first international anthologies of European poetry mm -hmm. and I am continuously amazed that his sensibility picked up some, some of the really important voices and writers or poets I should say in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. I mean he was very close to it. It wasn't as if he was going yes. to look a hundred years thereafter. And, but I always was amazed that he put that anthology together. Mm -hmm. there's, there are all the different, each country has its tradition, but there's, there's mm -hmm. a lot of interaction. Yeah, and especially at that time, they weren't going into sitting in an airplane and get over there. Yeah, yeah so. Amazing. Well, I think we're coming to a conclusion. Thank you very much for having talked or expressed, I should say, some of your ideas and some of your reactions to the composition of the 19th century poetry, an area that I believe is extremely important for 20th century writing and composition. It's fascinating. Yeah, it's very it's fascinating. It's inexhaustible. Yeah. And like the music, the more I do it, the more I discover it. Yes. I, ne I never feel I'm getting near exhausting mm. what's, what's, mm. what's going on inside it. Thank well, you very much. Yeah, and thank you, and we're looking forward to your performance tomorrow night.